If your creative push has helped you, you can help out the show by shopping on Amazon.com. All you have to do is head to yourcreativepush.com slash Amazon. That will take you right there and you can shop how you normally would. A small percentage of your purchases will go directly to helping cover the costs of creating, hosting, and maintaining your creative push. And you can make a big difference just by buying the things that you're going to anyway. Again, that's yourcreativepush.com slash Amazon. And thank you for thinking of the show and for helping out. Your Creative Push, episode 286. Everything is infinite. You're never going to say it all. So just say something. Say the next thing. Welcome to Your Creative Push, the podcast that pushes you to pursue your creative passions. I'm your host, Youngman Brown, and my guest today is Tom Hart. Tom is a cartoonist, a New York Times bestselling author, the creator of many graphic novels and books, and he is the executive director of the Sequential Artist Workshop, or SAW, which is a school and arts organization in Gainesville, Florida. And he comes on the show today to tell us all about his artistic and creative journey, including his early love of Peanuts, one of my personal favorites, uh, and the exuberance, confusion, and anger that Charles Schultz was able to convey through his characters and how that affected him throughout his artistic journey. He talks about another important influence, Scott McCloud's understanding comics, which changed the way that he thought about approaching comics and how he was able to continue working on comics through his initial artistic shortcomings. Tom also talks about following your instincts and how he dealt with adversity, with setbacks and failures in an extremely difficult and frustrating business. Tom gives us a look into his book, How to Say Everything, and how it remained 90% finished for nearly a decade. And the lesson that he learned from that is getting used to putting things behind you and just moving forward. Tom also gives us a look into how Saw started and what its students accomplished throughout the program. And finally, tricking your inner critic into thinking that what you're doing really isn't all that important after all. One of my favorite things about your creative push is when listeners reach out to me uh, saying how the show has influenced them and also saying how different artists uh, or programs have influenced them and maybe I should try to connect with those people and try to get them on the show. And this was the case with Tom. One of the listeners reached out and said that the school uh, sequential artist workshop changed her life and I needed to get Tom on the show if I could and I'm so glad that she did reach out to me because I had such a fun time talking with Tom. He's a guy that really thinks about all of this creative stuff for a living. Um, So it was great to have him on and I thoroughly enjoyed my conversation and I know that you are going to as well. So without further ado, here you go. My conversation with Tom Hart. Tom, welcome to your creative push, man. Hi. uh, Thanks. Thanks so much. Well, thanks for being here. Uh, You're I got put on to you by one of your former students, uh, Melissa, and she just had so many great things to say about how basically um, Sequential Artist Workshop, how it changed her life, and uh, and just all of the positive kind of messages you're putting out there and the education that you're giving to these people, to uh, upcoming artists. So um, before we get into Saul and kind of what it is, um, I was hoping maybe you could give us kind of a brief backstory, kind of uh, how you got to the point you are today, uh, creatively speaking. Sure. Well, I'm a cartoonist. I write and draw picture stories or comics or, you know, graphic novels or whatever you call them. And it's pretty much the only thing I'm any good at. If I'm good at that at all, it's the only thing I'm good at. I would say that you are. (laughs) Thanks. Uh, And I blame, I think I blame Peanuts, Charlie Brown and Snoopy and all that. Um, When I was, uh, my, some of my earliest creative memories are tracing and copying Peanuts right out of the newspaper at age seven or so. It just was a, a, a great comic strip, and it really spoke to me in a lot of ways. And, and I went back as an adult. I mean, I, I, I never stopped reading Peanuts, but I went back with sort of adult eyes and looked back and, and realized that what was that what I think appealed to me was the emotion in it. And I went particularly back to what I would have been reading when I was seven. And I just you know looked around at, at some of these were from around 1976 or so, I suppose. And I just, there's just so much anger (laughs) in them. And, uh, you know, Peppermint Patty is uh, slugging somebody and Sally is screaming at somebody and Lucy is always screaming and there's just so much anger in it. And um, I I realized that that appealed to me. 
And I, I think as a kid, it helped me navigate the emotional world. And I think having these emotions, and it wasn't just anger, and I can talk about that, but having these emotions sort of in little boxes, in little contained moments, and having the characters kind of limited too, right? You know, you sort of knew what to expect from Lucy. It's sort of hard to hard to explain, but going back, I, I realized that that emotion and boxes and characters were all what really moved me as a kid. And it never, and it never stopped. And, and when I went again, when I went backwards and looked at my own work, I found that I was really just mimicking peanuts in a lot of ways, but I saw that in addition to anger, <laughs> which I pointed out just cause it's very flashy there. I, I think exuberance, confusion, and anger were the three things I saw the most in peanuts. And that came out the most in my own work. I should say that when, when I tried to do any comics, they were always lousy. I never had any idea what to do <laughs> or how to go about it or anything. I think um, I never really, never really thought about it. Actually, that raw, that sort of raw emotion that is in Peanuts, and Peanuts was really sophisticated, and it's not just emotional; it's psychological, and it's a lot of other things. But, but that that what grabbed me again as a kid was what I tried to use as a as a young adult, and so I would have some sort of feeling, right? Some sort of emotion. And I would try and put it somehow into a comic characters and panels and stuff like that. And it would never work out. I didn't know. I didn't have any tools. It just didn't, it just didn't work. And I went even to um, the school of visual arts in New York city, which was the only place at the time that taught cartooning. And I thought, okay, well, these guys, they'll sort me out. They'll teach me how to make comics or whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That experience was pretty disappointing in a number for a number of ways, reasons. Oh, I mean, it's too complicated to go into why it was disappointing. But I will say that the, the main thing was that some of the people around me, there, there were very, 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 um, very sort of separate types, right? Uh, there were the, the guys who really just wanted to draw like, you know, superhero comics. And they really wanted to draw like, what, what really what they drew was dirty superhero comics right <laughs> and then then there were the handful of weirdos of which i was one and the most of the weirdos were really good at drawing comics and they were really funny or they were really imaginative and they just like let these sort of these like sort of streams of stories flow out of them and i never could do that i think in my entire first year of art school i think i made two pages of comics i just didn't get it and it was really, really frustrating. I didn't know what was wrong with me. I dropped out of that school. I moved to Seattle, which is where the, the comics sort of center at the time was, alternative comics center anyway. Fanographics is a big publisher even still. This would be about 1990, I think. Uh, and they had, they had recently moved to Seattle, and there were a lot of older cartoonists there. There were a lot of younger cartoonists there. And so I just said, well, the heck with this art school thing. I'm going to Seattle where the cartoonists were, are. That was a pretty good idea. <laughs> um, I met a lot of cartoonists my own age, 21, 22. And we all really just egged each other on. We sort of like dissected what was what we liked about each other's stories. We encouraged everyone to do longer stories and et cetera. But there was still there was still something lacking. Like I still didn't like like I would have some sort of thought or some sort of feeling, and it was sort of like just kind of like a top i would just sort of spin it until the energy ran out and then and then just see if it was any good afterwards i'd look at the page and i'm like oh that stinks or that's pretty good and if it was pretty good i'd put it in a mini comic and i'd take it down to the photocopy place and put it in a little zine with like you know 12 other pages or something but, but there are plenty of that which is lousy and i just didn't i just didn't have the skills to know how to make a good one again i was just like it was just like just pure energy, but it wasn't like raw. There was, it, there was no raw talent. There was no, the energy wasn't necessarily good. There was no structure. There, there were just like, I had no idea. And so at some point, I guess I'm 22, 23 or something like that. And I take a cross country trip. I sort of like by bus, by train, a little bit of everything. And I make my way to um, Northampton, Massachusetts, which is where Tundra publishing is. And a friend of mine is a, uh, graphic designer there or something. And he shows me an advanced copy of Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics. 
And so I take it to the train tracks nearby. I just sort of read it on the train tracks <laughs> and, um, and it blew my mind and it was so, so wonderful. And I, I don't know when I realized this particular way of phrasing it, but I, but, but I instantly understood that I could use my intellect, you know, you could think about what you were doing. And up till then I hadn't ever known that. I just thought you were, you were a good artist. If you put some stuff down on the page and it was great that meant you were a good artist. And I was never that. I was just always like just full of regret and shame. And I just couldn't figure out why it was so hard for me when I realized, and, and for those who don't know this, this book, it's, it really just breaks down how comics work in, in a variety of different ways. This is how they work visually. This is how the sort of syntax of the storytelling works. And this is how words and pictures work together. And it was like, my mind just fried. It was so wonderful. And I realized like, oh, okay, you can think about these things. And then I got really interested in thinking about these things. And I still worked from emotion. You know, I still worked from like, I got these big feelings, you know, this, these, I mentioned anger and confusion and, and exuberance. I really think it's that that's the cocktail I worked with for a long time. But now I knew I could put those into characters and I could have characters emote in certain ways and I could inject situations and right, not even just situations, but work on plot. And all this stuff seems very natural, but it wasn't to me. I needed to be told that this art form was made up of moving parts and you could apply your, your thinking process to it. So came back from that trip, my mind all abuzz, and, and I sort of sat down and uh, sitting, standing, running, I don't know, and just worked on my first, like, this, I want this to be the book that really, like, says who I am. This is, like, this is the, the book I want people to know. And so I worked on that for a year or something, and that was a 56-page book, which, again, at this late nowadays – Kids are 14 and they're, they're working on 50, 60 page books. But back then it was, it was, it felt like an accomplishment, but that was the first, that was the first, I really sort of managed to get everything sort of in a line a little bit. Like, so there's the emotional content, but there's also the, like the, the, the rigor and the craft. So that book was real, a real important benchmark for me. When I, when I made that book, everything changed because I understood the process better and that was just a a great experience. And from then, I mean, that was 20 years ago from then I've made a million books, most of which are still bad, but they're bad for reasons I can actually, (laughs) (laughs) the reasons I can actually dissect and, 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 um, and describe, but you know, I was always trying to try new things after I understood that, that much of the process, I'd be like, okay, so what if we change the structure a little bit? Or what if, you know, what if I, try to go a little deeper with this kind of character development or what if I try something a little stranger with the way the characters inter- interact or what if I sort of fracture time I did all sorts of playfulness playful things with story and sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't and that's what I mean by they're bad but but right, right. but I was always um, just having fun with it once I once I sort of reached that point where where I could I knew I could think about it and I could let the feeling sort of come out once those two things were sort of working in, in tandem, I was really happily prolific and productive. And I, I think that's when I finally found that the passion that I had at, you know, at age seven or whatever, that I could keep, you know, that I could really keep it alongside of me um, for a long time. Yeah. And it's really interesting. Like in that story. Um, yeah, it's, it's great to be able to like experiment once you get your feet under you. But my question is like, cause we talk about the gap a lot in the, in the show, uh-huh. like having a taste for something that's really good. And for you, you had that at an early age and it can be really discouraging when you have that gap, when you have, when you know how good things can be and your skill set just isn't there yet. Um, so my question is like from such an early age, realizing the emotionality of something as simple as like peanuts cartoons and realizing that that's where like the heart of it is, you know, Mm -hmm. how did that not discourage you? Like, how did you just keep trying (laughs) without, you know, quitting until you finally did get your feet under you? Yeah. Well, that's a a good question. There's so many moving parts in comics. There's, um, you know, there's, there's, there's the writing and the drawing, but there's also like, you know, creating 
characters that have a certain vitality to them and and uh, you know there's even language and stuff and so there's so many things to have a gap about <laughs> <laughs> um and so i was always very tenacious and i always believed that i was doing something that um that was kind of new in in that a, a lot of people who who create at least at least for a long period of time they create the things that they'd like to see because those things don't exist you know you hear this from musicians and from writers and from all sorts of all sorts of people and so I, I tried to create the things that I wanted to exist and I was very inspired by you know we talked about that emotion emotionality or whatever and um a, a, a prime influence at that time period was Julie Doucet, who actually, I think it's actually pronounced Doucet, but um, she's a great cartoonist who's really raw on the page, but, but really draws really beautifully and has this really interesting craft to it. And she was probably the closest, you know, tra- you know, it's sort of outgrown Charles Schultz and the peanuts at this point. And now I'm, you know, in my early twenties and I've got, trying to, trying to get an edge, <laughs> you know, and so Julie was probably the closest. So if I, so if I was going to say, where's this gap? What am I trying to, what am I idolizing? And what am I trying to, what am I trying to reach? It would probably be something like her work. And it's weird. I think I just believed in myself. I think I just believed, and, I, and it might be a sort of wiring thing. I like, I sort of like most people and I want to know what they have to say. And I sort of trusted that if I was, speaking honestly and but also playfully that people would want to read it and or see it or at least it was worth something it was worth putting out into the world and i know i haven't answered your question about the gap and the reason is is because the biggest gap is is for me was and, and remains in the visuals and if you're you and your listeners talk about that often then you, you probably know that the remedy is often suggested to just do lots of work. And I totally believe that. And the more work I did, the better I got at all of those things. But I think I got better at certain things quicker. I think I got better at storytelling at a different rate than I got better at drawing. And so there's still this gap with drawing that I don't, you know, that I really feel profoundly and it's never going to, I'm never going to close that gap. But there also has to be a point where you're, where you realize like, okay, this is what I have to work with. You know, style is, kind of a mixture of all, all the things you're trying to reach and aren't reaching to some degree. And sometimes you just have to sort of reflect and look at the paper and say, okay, this is what I've got. I can finesse this style as much as, as, as much as I can. I can sort of tweak it and massage it and make it look best version of itself it can be, but it's never going to be Charles Schultz. It's never going to be Julie Doucet. It's never going to be Walt Kelly. The creator of Pogo is always a big, a big beacon for me too. I'd love to draw like him, but I never, ever will. So you have to just sort of like take a breath, look at your own work and say, okay, how can I make this gnarly thing <laughs> better? And, and, you know, it requires, a, it requires a little bit of objectivity and a little bit of self-love. You know, you have to be able to say, this isn't those things, but it's kind of got something going for it. It's kind of got its own little gnarly power and I love it and I want to make it better. And I can make it better by changing these things and getting a little bit better at this and working on that. And so that's how you do it. But it does take lots of time and yeah. lots of work. Yeah. Yeah. Like you said, objectivity, self-love, and I'd add acceptance, you know, like just accepting that yeah. you can push yourself as, as hard as you can. You can practice and practice and practice. And sometimes at the end of the day, it's like, okay if if you <laughs> feel like you're never in your life going to reach that point because that just means you're going to continue to evolve like if you ever do feel like you reach that point where you're like yes i made it i'm the best <laughs> like that means like the game's over like there's no room to improve or at least like you your ego maybe has you reached are. a point where you feel like there's no room to improve and that's no fun for anybody <laughs> no not a, not any any creator again comics is a I'll say it again, it's so full of so many different parts that it does seem where that there are creators who can hit a certain stride, let's say visually, and not change. Because once they sort of like give themselves that 
consistency. Like this is how I draw and this is how I'm going to draw and it's going to look darn consistent for the next 10 or 15 years. So get used to it. But if they're good artists, it allows them to really get creative on the other side. It lets them get creative with the storytelling or the characters they're inventing or whatever. So there are certain parts that you can get a little satisfied with just so long as you don't get satisfied with it all. I think, you know, I mean, I mean, I'm not going to tell anybody how to create, but I know I dissatisfaction is, is a strong motivator. I like to try and get better at all these things. Although drawing is hard. <laughs> yeah. I think all forms of creativity are, but especially drawing, you're right. Yeah. yeah. So you have lived a creative life and you've dealt with a lot of struggles and you have this new book out, How to Say Everything, and you also run Saw. Um, so I guess, how have you been able to kind of put those lessons into each of those things. And have you found that maybe like one isn't enough? Is, is that why you keep creating um, things like in order to help other people? Well, yeah, you know, there's, there's I, I don't know. I've got, I've got endless amounts of energy for, for things that aren't going to uh, have long-term effects in the world. <laughs> um, <laughs> that, that top never stops spinning, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. The top, right. Yeah. I, just came up with that metaphor, but I think you're right. Let's let's keep that metaphor going. Let's keep um, it. Well, I should I should point out that all those you know after I got my the I think you said I got my feet under me. I created all these stories and stuff and 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 blah blah blah. And around um, some some point, you know, maybe uh, the year doesn't matter, 2004, I guess, or something like that. I realized that that my first love was comic strips, the three panel things, the four panel things. And then I never really tried them. I sort of disdained them, actually, as an adult or as a young adult. And you open up the newspaper, and aside from Calvin and Hobbes, it's all junk. And I never, ever thought there was, there was any reason to try that form. But for some reason, I did. And I'm not even sure why. Like, you know, I tend to follow intuition. And not, rant, not like, recklessly. I, tr- I tend to listen a lot. And, like, oh, if, like, the suggestion comes from in, inside to, hey, you should maybe try comic strips. You might like it. And if I, that comes up again and again, I'll be like, I'll find myself doing a comic strip and realize, like, oh, suddenly I'm doing a comic strip. But it's not sudden. It's, it's usually you're sort of listening to yourself. But anyway, I decided to do daily strips for a while. And, and I, I got in slowly. This was really at the beginning of web comics. And a, and a friend of mine is really good at them. And she's very, very funny. And I collaborated with her. I said, look, look why don't we, like, we'll write sort of a plot and you just write the strips and I'll draw them. Cause I, I want to understand this rhythm. I want to understand this three panel, four panel rhythm, four panels is what we did. And I just want to sort of like, I just want to get it into my body. Like I want to, I want to, I want to have it integrated. She would, I think we were emailing. Yeah. So I think she would email like three or four at a time and I would just do my best to keep, keep them up five, five a week. I think we did. And, um, you know, it's good to have a partner. It's good to have a partner keeping you accountable. It's like, here's my, here's my half. Where's your half? It's um, huge. Yeah. Anyway, so I did, I did, we did that, I think, for eight months or something. And then I was like, okay, training wheels off. I'm going to do this on, on my own. And I did my own, the Hutch Owen character. That was a character I invented in 94. And I'd done a bunch of stories with. I said, it's going to be a comic strip and I'm just going to, I'm going to do two things. One is I'm going to do this and have a lot of fun with it. And two, I'm going to sell it to the syndicates. And they're going to think I'm brilliant <laughs> and, pay me, and pay me lots of money. So, <laughs> um, I like both of those plans, by the way. <laughs> well, we'll see where this winds up. Um, <laughs> so I did wind up doing it, I think for three or four years. And there was sort of a weird division point right in the middle. Cause I'd been doing it, on, doing it on the web and just sort of getting better at it. And, uh, quicker at it and and yes still trying to sell it to um to the syndicates and there's maybe three or four main syndicates in the country that's that's it and so basically knocking on those doors again over and over again but the funny thing is is that the person who is editor and chief of one of them is a good friend of mine like a good friend and so i'd be like um hey uh uh Brendan, you should, uh, you should buy my strip. <laughs> mm-hmm. and, and, and he was like, well, you know, it's just, it's just not appropriate for the newspapers. The newspapers aren't going to buy it and blah, blah, blah. And so that didn't deter me. And what happened at that midway point is I actually managed to sell it to two commuter papers in New York and Boston called the Metro. And 
this was at a, the, the Metro was like out of Norway or something. It is, it is a European commuter paper. And they were just trying to, I think there's one in Philly actually. And, that, and they were just trying to get into the American market. And so they didn't exactly have a big plan, so, but they knew they wanted the daily strip. I came along at the right time. I met the right friend, like, you know, an employee brought me to the editor. The editor said, yeah, we're looking for a daily strip. And so, so they paid me to, to do my strip as a, as a daily strip for basically until I got fired <laughs> and, and I got fired. And I don't know how much you talk about this kind of industry stuff in, on your podcast, but you know, editor, editorships change all the time. And, and if you're in a creative position and you're, and, and you, you've got a job that one editor signed off on and then that editor, editor leaves, all you're doing is just like wondering how many editors you're going to make it through. It's like, okay, is this editor going to find me, fire me? You're getting a new editor. Is that an editor going to fire me? Anyway, a couple editors later, they fired me, which was fine because in fact, I think actually they, uh, canceled me and they just put in another Sudoku or something. So they were like, this is much cheaper to, to put in a, a oh. I know, I know. Um, but anyway, so comic, as I mentioned, comic strips, they're kind of a lousy medium. Like they're, they're no good. <laughs> um, and, um, and that's not really true, but I just think that they're, they are very limited, right? Um, both, especially if you're trying to sell them to a, a wide audience, you're, you're going to be very limited to, certain kind of mainstream um, sensibility. And also they're limited in, in scope, you know, they're four panels and the characters don't tend to change that much. Um, so, so they are very limited. And, and I had previously set my sights differently, but, but I was having a lot of fun with comics. The crazy thing was I should, I should have felt like I was set free when I got fired from that. And instead I felt myself like just not done yet with that form. And again, like I said, I sort of go by intuition a lot and it's not, you know, I, why not? What, what, what other, what other guide do I have? And so something was telling me, do more strips, you know, you're really enjoying this. And I, and I did enjoy it a lot and I enjoyed the pressure. I enjoyed the deadlines. I enjoyed like, like, um, I know you guys talk a lot about like you know, the, the critic inside of you and, and that critic barely has time to get to the table if you're doing a daily strip. Like nice. you're, yeah. you're, you know, you're, you're like pulling an idea, you're pulling another idea. You're saying, okay, that's today's idea. And then you're, you know, and the critic might be, you know, this sucks. And you're like, dude, it's three o'clock. I got to be done by five. So shut up. You know, <laughs> so this is the crazy thing is I contacted my friend, um, Margo. And I said, Margo, I think what the world needs now, and this was about 2007, I guess. And Margo is um, half Palestinian. She was raised in California, um, but her dad is Palestinian. And I said, Margo, what the world needs now is a family-friendly Arab-American comic strip written and drawn by you and based on your life experiences. And she said, you're crazy. Hmm. And I said, think about it. And then she called me back a couple of days later and she said, okay, I thought about it. Let's try it. And the crazy thing is we wrote and sketched like maybe two weeks worth of strips. I brought it to that same editor friend of mine and he said bring me two more weeks of strips and we'll sign a contract mm. it was that easy wow and i was like what you <laughs> <laughs> so how that system works is that um you sort of work with the editor in really tight a lot of back and forth a lot of dialogue and you work with him or her to develop the strip and get a real good solid backlog like nine months worth of strips before they start trying to sell it to the newspapers so that they can see here's where the strip is, here's where the characters are, here's six months of the strip, et cetera, et cetera. So we did all that for eight or nine months or something. So finally we're done. And now it's just a sort of waiting game. Let's see, like the strips are done. Let's just see how it goes as far as the sales to the newspapers go. That's when the economy collapses, like October, 2008. Bam. Yay. Yay. <laughs> that's right when i graduated college oh <laughs> my god i'm so sorry it's a fun, fun sorry time for, for all sorry for all I'm sorry of for you too I'm sorry for <laughs> you too. <laughs> so these salespeople, they go out and as far as i know they're still driving around and like this is how it's done these days like they still drive from paper to paper with like portfolios for the comic strips like even in 2008 not it's not online it's not i mean i'm sure there's follow-ups and stuff but i still think they they go door to door 
Um, and anyway, they're like, we have this uh, family friendly Arab American strip by these two weirdos. And the newspapers are all like, you're crazy. <laughs> and we need to pay less for, for Blondie and Hagar the Horrible because we're going broke here. So it was a bad time to launch a new strip like that. The, the strip uh, didn't really launch. You know, we had that huge backlog, but it pretty much just never launched in the papers. And I was left like, still, you know what? Let's use that metaphor again. I was still spinning like a top. I was like, this, there was so much there in that process of making comic strips that at this point, I'd probably done it for four years, pretty, pretty regularly. And I just loved that process so much. I wrote 85% of how to say everything probably in three or four months. I just sort of like documented everything I did, everything I believed, everything that kept me going, everything that inspired me. And so by early 2009, that book was mostly done. And then I would tink, I tinkered with it for eight years <laughs> or something. And finally, you know, I did between that period and, and, and finishing it, I did tons of other stuff. And, but always it was sitting there like, why isn't this finished? Why didn't you finish this? Like sometimes I was waiting for the right piece of art or I was waiting just to sort of flesh out a, you know, a couple paragraphs. And I mean, it was really 85, it might've been 90 to 95% done, maybe 90. And then eventually I was like, this is crazy, Tom, you have to be a person who finishes something. Hmm. Anything that didn't have an image, I just, throughout like you know i work in this in design it's a computer program that's for laying out books and stuff and so if there was an empty box that said image to come i just threw out the box no image <laughs> like and if there was like if there was a bunch of like fake text where some text was gonna be i i took a, a look at it and if if i could write and there wasn't a lot like there you know there was maybe five or six places where that happened and if it was something i could write easily then I wrote it. And if it wasn't, I just deleted that whole page or whatever. And I was just like, I'm going to finish this because you can't let something this close to being finished sit for nine years or however long it was, 2008. So I think it was January of this year I finished it. But really, I just like, I just finally said, and your creative push is a great term for it. I just said, I'm going to push this thing through and finish it. This is, this is nuts. Um, but it is, it's also was, it really, um, it really did sum up a lot of what I believed about creativity and about storytelling and about finding your own material. You know, if, if I can, I'll, I'll talk about the title because it's important. Like w when I was starting out, I, I, I had this sort of belief that you had to know what you wanted to say. And then you say it, right? You're like, oh, well, I've got this idea. It's about a dancer and uh, she falls in love with a airline pilot and and uh, it's, it's a long story and there's a climax where they, and they you know, or whatever. And, and I never thought that way, not in, not in three or four panels and not in big books. And especially when I was starting, I didn't have any idea what I wanted to say. And, and what I say was, I felt like I wanted to say everything. It's like, how could you ask me a question? Like, what do you want to say? I want to say everything. It's all in there dying to come out. Well, that's kind of a recipe for, sloppiness and depression you know if you feel like you've got a lot to say but it's not coming out so what i tried to do was show the tools that helped me get that stuff out but but again it's all about the surprise it's all about like you don't know what that everything is until it comes out and then you tinker with it you know you play with it but but you you have tools to like excavate a little bit or or turn a flashlight on that part of your 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 mind or your history or your emotions or whatever and you and, and you just like play and it's tons of it's tons of play and everything if i'm going to use everything with a capital e and as in how to say everything everything is infinite you're never going to say it all so just say something say the next thing put a couple thoughts together that are today's thoughts and put those out there because tomorrow's thoughts are going to be different and they're all going to be part of this continuous you and that's all great. And so that's what the book's about. And, and I'm glad I finished it. You know, I've been talking about this stuff for so long, saying there's a book almost finished about this, that, which I, which I want to share with you. So finally, I was just like, this is crazy. You know? Well, it's it's very interesting, like listening to you say that um, about, you know, how, how you want to say everything. That's exactly what my mind goes through as a writer um, mm -hmm. when I get this like 
big idea of like a, a blog post I want to write or a novel or a story or whatever. Um, and I'm like, there's so many things in my mind. How am I going to like map this out? And oftentimes writers say, you know, do an outline, like make an outline, have it all planned out before you actually start writing the words. But I, I am the opposite. I need to do exactly what you said is just write something, <laughs> you know, write that first idea down and then see kind of where it goes. And for me, it is like spinning a top and then just going, going, going while the ideas are flowing, trying to get them down as quickly as possible. And that's my outlining is writing my first draft. Mm -hmm. and that's what works for me. But all of those ideas in your head can stop you in your tracks and can sometimes stop they've stopped me from creating for years sometimes from writing that one thing I, I know I needed to write. Um, it's just like the idea of starting. So that's perfect advice is just, just write something when you want to write everything. Yeah. It's, it's so, it's so true that, and, and those, those big ideas will, they'll scare you, but they won't scare you because like they're big and dark and serious. They'll scare you because you'll get freaked out about the journey. You'll get freaked out about the length of it, you know, you'll you'll get freaked out that you won't have the tenacity to finish it or that you'll realize halfway through it that's a, that it's a bad idea or something so there's so many things so at least at least for me i have to sort of trick myself into just doing small ideas and and if if a big idea can be threaded together out of all those little ideas then great but i i, I think for me i have to like let that come later Everybody sort of has to sort of trick their inner editor a sort of different way, you know. And that's why I loved comic strips so much. And I haven't really gotten back to it until just recently. But again, that quick rhythm, that quick turnaround, that those, those short deadlines, eventually you do enough of those. And I mean, and, and you sort of stay true to, your, to what you believe in. I mean, you can really just crank out junk and nothing's going to come of it. But if you if you have some sort of integrity and everybody's capable of integrity for sure if you have some sort of integrity then eventually these like larger patterns are going to emerge and they'll be like oh that character wants to go here and look how these stories from six months apart are really similar it's because this theme wants to emerge and i should try and do that again a little more consciously or something now is that type of a realization is that something that like every artist or every creative person has to go through themselves. Like they all have to go through that kind of initiation or that um, kind of becoming, you know, like that becoming a man thing <laughs> in, in tribes, like going out into the jungle and figuring it out for yourself, like killing that lion or that cheetah or whatever for yourself and bringing it back to the village. Or is it something that you're able to kind of share as like the tribe elder, <laughs> so to speak, like at saw, um, is that something that's like kind of teachable or does everybody have to go through that, um, learning experience themselves? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and that, that does come up a lot. So yeah, I opened my own comic school after I, I, I was teaching in New York city at, at the school of visual arts, same school I dropped out of, by the way, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, from 2001 to 2010 or 2011 or so. And I started my own school and to this day, I'm not a hundred percent sure why I started my own school, except, um, it, it, again, it just seemed like it had to happen. Comics were getting a little bit bigger. I'm a little bit feral and I want to, uh, you know, I want to do things my own way. I wanted to, I wanted to run a school that would have a, maybe a theatrical component and be, have a little more focus on content and emotion rather than just technique and also, I didn't know who else would hire me, you know, <laughs> so variety of things. But what you're asking about is, yeah, it comes up, it comes up a lot and you're not sure, like, how do you encourage students to make certain kind of right mistakes, you know, and it comes up a lot, especially with, again, what we were talking about a little bit with, which is big projects, you know, I balance it all the time and sometimes I don't make the right choices. But like, if I see a student working on a big project I know they're going to fumble with it and I know eventually they're going to give it up. You know, do I say something? Do I say, well, what tends to happen is you tend the students tend to start a big project and, and fumble, but, or do I say, do something small, do it next, you know, do it for next week and then do something small again the following week. And I try to do a balance of those things, but it's funny how, like, if you give them, a, at least I find this often, that if you give them a lot of like little assignments and you get them sort of used to their own rhythms, right? That's an important part of it. And used to their own, um, you know, their own creative 
decisions and energies and stuff like that. And sometimes still you're like, okay, training wheels are off. You can have four weeks, five weeks. And I want to hear what you'd like to accomplish in those four weeks. And it's always like, oh, well, I want to do an 80 page story. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and you're like, oh no, what was <laughs> I, I was trying to teach you to not think like that. So, but I don't yeah. know, but, um, but a lot of times, you know, making the mistakes out in the woods of your own is good, but I think it's, it's really good as a teacher to, you know, or as a student to have somebody to talk to and say, yeah, you know, is it okay that I don't finish this story? You know, that, that happens a lot where students will say, is it okay if I don't, you know, and you say, yeah, yeah, it's okay. You've learned a lot. I mean, let's, let's cover some of the things you learned about in getting this far on the story. You know, you know, maybe they got better at some of the technical things about you know, creating characters and backgrounds and, and dialogue and those kinds of things. But also maybe they realize like, it's just not satisfying to have a huge idea and try and sort of like execute your way through it. Like that isn't, that wasn't very satisfying. And also at a, when, when you're very young, your, your use of language, whether it's visual or verbal or whatever changes a lot, you know, your style is changing it just accidentally, just from usage. And so that can become discouraging for students too. If they're trying to tackle something big, they're like, well, page one doesn't look like page eight. Should I redraw it? And I'm like, no, do not redraw it. Keep moving forward. And again, get used to like uh, putting things behind you, you know. So the school is like, it's designed, you know, this. I'm really proud of the school. It is a crazy little place. And again, I'm not sure what crazy bunch of neurons in my head thought it was a good idea, but it, we've mostly had good outcomes. It's a non, it's a very unaccredited school. It's run in a very small space that used to be a wood shop. We've got some really good faculty, but we ask students to like, you know, move down here and we'll teach you writing and drawing and everything else we know and everything we don't know, we'll talk to you about how we don't know it. And it's, it's, you know, a little bit that the space is tight. The quarters are, are tight. Everybody gets to know each other really well. And at the end, you don't get a degree <laughs> or anything, but hopefully we've, uh, you know what, you know, uh, I'll be, I'll be honest. We've, We've had a lot of people say we've changed their life. And I don't know, you know, were they just at a, at a point in their creative, their young creative life and, and just any intense experience would have changed their life? Probably. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's mm-hmm. cool. Um, but I know, I, I think we specifically have changed a couple that like, that is because of our particular energy. And when I say our, I'm mostly talking about um, myself and my co-teacher who's, whose name is Justine. And she's like, I'm the sort of like, writing and storytelling and everything you have inside of you is great and just let it come out i'm that guy and she's like she's mm-hmm. the she's like the, the technician and the craft and you're setting your standards too low and you should try and be better and i know you can be better and you know you can be better so so we're definitely we're in this really interesting dynamic and i think that i think that particular dynamic and also you know we're, we're pretty good like I'm a pretty good writer and she's an excellent artist. I can speak objectively about how incredible she is. Um, so, you know, we also have that skill, but, but also like Justine suffers in a way I don't, she suffers from intense OCD and anxiety. And it, she, she's actually worked it into her curriculum once a year. Now she like has an anxiety and OCD lecture because so many of the students have it. You know, and they're, they hmm. get so much out of it. And I don't think that happens in two other, other schools. It's because we have this weird informal school where, where we can talk about those things. So anyway, I'm really, I'm really proud of the school. It's a strange little beast in a strange little state or strange big state, Florida. We've done a lot. We've done a lot of good and we've had a lot of people write back to us. Even students who are like a little bit inattentive have written us letters saying, you know, what you guys taught me was so good and I'm, and I'm sorry I was inattentive. <laughs> um, but I now look back on it and every day I think about it and, and, and so valuable. And people have said, you know, I would have probably would have quit if I hadn't, if I hadn't gone through that year with you guys. Um, yeah. So we're really proud of that. Yeah. I think that's maybe one of the downfalls. I don't want to, I don't know if downfalls is the right word, but uh, one of the problems maybe with, school schools in general Mm -hmm. (laughs) maybe not just art schools um just education especially maybe in america is like there's not that like realness to it like where okay let's talk about 
real life mm-hmm. issues mm-hmm. <laughs> right now. Like not like let's talk about who is the fifth president. Let's <laughs> you know all those things are important and good, but um, there's not that much like life education where like this is how you don't build credit mm-hmm. card debt or this is how you save money or any type like insert any type of real world sure. use cases. Uh, there's a lot of ways that the education system I think fails people, and when you can have an education type of setting where the people are like, all right, let's have real talk right now. (laughs) Like, this is what I suffer from. Like I have OCD or I have, I'm incredibly lazy or (laughs) um, here's how you sell Mm -hmm. work. I mean, there's so many different ways that you can get real with people. Um, And when you can have that kind of a system where it's like, all right, let me just share everything I know. And like you said, when you don't know something, like let's talk Mm -hmm. about that too. Um, I think it's really important rather than having this like holier than now type of mindset. Yeah, sure. Or working through some, from some uh, rote curriculum or something, or, you know, this is what you say about getting work, managing your time and stuff like that. And, don't mention that people are sometimes lazy, you know, and don't mention that sometimes you don't get work and don't, (laughs) you know, don't mention that there's no money in the arts. That's the catalog for our school says you're going to get lots of jobs, you know? Yeah. um, Right. So yeah, we don't, we, we're not that school for sure. You know, we're, we actually, you know, I mean, I, I moved away from New York city in part to remove myself from the commercial world because I was so, so stressed out by it. I was so needing to plug myself into it. I was so even just subconsciously trying to plug myself into it, even when I wasn't actively trying to like pitch something or something. And finally, I reached this point here in Gainesville where I don't, I know commercial aspirations. I'm actually keep like, keep them away. <laughs> mm-hmm. I want to yeah. do the, you know, I want to do the work and I'll share it with whoever's, whoever's game art schools, especially will, will certainly sell you on the, the valuable careers you're going to wind up with afterwards. And I, I always believed that art was something you did because it was, it felt like something you needed to do. You know, there was something in your spirit or in your head that was just saying, Hey, put me on the page, put me on the canvas, whatever. And it's true that our world our culture likes stories and likes some forms of art, some forms of art a lot more than other forms of art. Um, so it's true that, you know, there are careers out there, but I'm not interested in, in <laughs> I'm interested in the art and I'm interested in the process and I'm interested in teaching the students how to access their drive and their potential. And, you know, and a lot of times, you know, we'll, t- you know, we'll tell them that, like, if you want a job and, animation will tell you everything we know but then get your butt out to LA and <laughs> you got to meet some people and maybe get a little more training because we didn't you know we taught you comics and we taught you storytelling but we didn't teach you storyboarding and the, the, the kind of character design they are going to want out but you know so if you if you want that job in animation get your butt out to LA if you want to be working in magazines and get your butt up to New York or whatever you know we tell them that too but most of them just want to stay in Florida because it's like, you know, it's warm and not much is uh, required of them. <laughs> After they graduate, yeah. you just kind of mellow out. <laughs> right. And what, so it's a year long uh, yeah, process? Yeah, it's a year long, year long program. Two semesters and then you have that sort of like summertime to sort of knock around the studio and use it as much as you want. And yeah, we've been in business um well, it's a nonprofit, not really a business, but we, we've been running since 2012. We've had 50 or 60 students pass through there. We also do week-long workshops that are um, that are pretty popular. Sometimes we'll have a visiting artist come through here. A woman named Julia Gaffer just gave a workshop last week that was really great. Other times it'll be come study with our regular faculty for a week. We do things like that two or three times a year. And uh, yeah, it's just this little comics comics haven comics utopia <laughs> i guess comics utopia yeah i um, like that <laughs> but yeah but again you know i'm really you know i, I called it sequential artist workshop because i really wanted to focus on the person i really wanted to focus on like like who are you who are you what story are you trying to tell let's let's get you to to, to be that person that's telling that story yeah i think like when you're a kid you get this 
joy, this passion from art. And mm-hmm. you can, that's what can sustain you, uh, even through all of the discouragement of not being that good at it or making crummy comics or <laughs> what have you. And then once that money thing comes into it, where you're like, all right, now I have to turn this passion or this skill or this love that I have for this thing into something that I can do for the rest of my life and way, find a way to sustain myself. Um, and that's where things get really, really murky. And I, I think sometimes that needs to get like beaten out of people <laughs> in order to get back to, like you said, telling your story, that's the most important thing that, that there is to art making. And I think that that's our job as creative people is to be able to tell that story as honestly as we can and get back to those roots as quickly and as uh, untethered as we can from, you know, all those other icky things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I believe that. And I mean, if we're not, assuming we're not headed for an apocalypse and every, and we're, you know, we're still all going to be here for another hundred or 200 years. I mean, not physically me for another hundred years, but humanity. (laughs) You never know. Um, You never know, Tom. Right. (laughs) That's true with all the gene splicing and stuff, but um, art makes us better people and sharing art makes us better people and, and, and working together in a variety of ways, you know, working together, building something, working better to change your society, working, you know, working together, but, Art especially, I think, gives us a sort of profound connection to our own humanity, and and with that connection, we can we can connect with other people better. That's what I'm mostly focused on, and what I what I try to stay focused on when we're teaching. And 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 yeah, you know, like you said, money comes up, and it's icky in some ways, and worth aspiring to in other ways. But um, that connection that art allows you with with your internal self and with your fellow people. I think that's the, that's the place where I focus my attention. Absolutely. Very cool. And, uh, people can find out more about sequential artist workshop. You can go to sawcomics.org. We'll have that all linked up mm-hmm. at today's show notes page, your creative push.com slash Tom Hart. Tom, it is time for the final push. And this is where I ask you to reach through your microphone and grab the shoulder of one of the listeners that you've already really inspired today and just give them your best final words of advice and really push them to pursue their own creative passions. Yeah. You know, I think we've, we've like exalted art in some ways and it's really just, it can, it can simply be something you do. It can simply be, you know, almost like, almost like a sport, you know, you can go out running and not treat it that seriously. You can go out running and treat it a little bit more seriously. You can go out and get a running partner and say, Hey, did you you run your two miles today? Yeah, I did my two miles today. Awesome. You can get a little bit more serious and you can say, I'm going to train for a 5k. It's like, okay, train for a 5k. You can get a little more serious and train for a marathon. And if you do that, like that takes work and it takes like specific types of training. I remember reading about it because I haven't run a marathon, but I remember reading about it and, and realizing that there's specific ways in you train and you actually never run the 26 miles until that last day, you know? And so there are techniques that are worth studying, but you can also just be a person who runs around the block a couple times and just gets that those endorphins running through your head uh, and, and through your body and, and get your brain clear and, Maybe I'm stretching this metaphor a little long, but no, I like it. But I, I, I think what I'm saying is, is that is that um, art should be something you do for yourself because it makes because it makes you feel good because it, it it makes you healthier. It feels good afterwards, even if you have that resistance. Like, okay, I don't feel like going running today. Well, okay, and then after like you haven't gone running for five or six days, you're like, what the hell are you running for anyway? Like, you never like <laughs> that. And like, all right, so you mm. need that. You, know, you need that buddy to say get running, you know, it's good to have partner. It's good to have community, but I'm sure Linda Berry has come up on your show often because she's just a genius who is incredibly inspiring. And um, she defined an artist. She says, an artist is somebody who does it anyway. That's what an artist is. And that's all, that's all it takes, you know, just do it anyway. Anybody who's telling you, you shouldn't do it, or there's a certain kind of way you should do it. Don't listen to them. Have your own standards. If you want to get better at something there are ways to get better and there are ways to study and there there are communities and partnerships and and mentors out there but if you just if you just want to doodle and keep doodling that's okay too i think everybody innately when they do get involved in an art form after a little while you do want to get better it's not hard to find training 
in, in just about any art form. But, you know, again, like there was a certain point a few years back, I took up the piano. It wasn't because I thought I was going to be a good piano player. I just thought, well, what's it like to play piano? <laughs> and here's the, here's an interesting thing. My teacher didn't know this, but I knew going in, I had maybe three months in me. Like I was going to try it for three months and then, and then get out. But I think my teacher really wanted me to strive harder, you know, like really get those, get those um, finger techniques down a little harder. And I was like, well, you know, I'm just playing, you know, I just want to see what it feels like to, to touch the keys and to make a couple notes. But there's a part of me that has done that now. There's a part of me that says, if I ever want to try that again, I've at least reached point one. And, and I, I can do that probably. I just need to find the will for it, but I've got other things going on and, and, and it, it's okay. I mean, it's, it's all okay. <laughs> you know, I think that's it. You know, it's let it, let it be okay. And, you know, and we, we talked about, again, we talked about the critic and the resistance and stuff like that. And, and sometimes you have to outwit it. And sometimes you need your, 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 your friends to kick you in the butt a little bit. Um, sometimes you need to work fast in order to outwit it. And sometimes maybe, maybe you can train it just to not take itself so seriously too. I, and and to, to be truthful, that's one way in which I trick it in that I, I fostered a certain kind of chaos in my process, which allows the critic to think it's not things I'm doing aren't really important. I, I like, hmm. I'm sort of like picking random bits a lot of times, especially when I was doing comic strips like this and that, and they don't really match up. So I'm not really serious about it, or at least that's what I'm telling my critic, right? That's what I'm telling the internal critic. But there are ways if you, if you practice that long enough, that the voice does calm down a little bit, you know, that voice starts to think that what you're doing isn't that important because it isn't, it's beautiful, but it's not, it, it's not going to like, you know what? I, no one knows what the critic thinks is going to happen, right? You know, what's going to happen if you fail at this art thing you're trying? Well, what, everyone's going to laugh at you? God's going to put his thumb on you and press you into the ground and squash you? Like, none <laughs> of these things are going to happen. And so if you can train, train the critic to, to realize that, and that takes, that takes a lot of training, but, but you can get it there. Anyway, I, I mean, I, there were like four metaphors in there, and there was like all, all sorts of rambling <laughs> in that. It, it was... it, it's beautiful. Yeah, and I think that's one of the most important lessons like from this podcast actually um in general is that you know it, it is okay to do it it's not life and death you're right it's not that important the the thing that you actually make the result of it like where it goes or whatever it's the act of doing it is that that's the important thing the the fact that you're doing it that you're trying it that you're maybe getting it out of your system you know you talked um about your students and how it's okay to have that realization halfway through a project that it's just not working. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I think that's something that stops people from doing something before they even start it is that fear that, you know, this is going to lead nowhere. It's going to end up being a failure. Um, but I think the even scarier thing is getting to the end of your life. And that thing is still on your checklist of things that you wanted to do all yeah. your life, you know, try playing the piano, mm -hmm. try whatever, try be, becoming a musician, try becoming a photographer or whatever. I think it's really valuable to get those things out of your system, to just go into them, not thinking that this is going to be my next career mm -hmm. or this is going to change my life, just going into them with the simple fact of, okay, I'm going to try it out. I'm going to enjoy the process of doing it, but it's not life and death. And I, at the very least, I get to check this off of my list and say that I did it. I tried mm -hmm. it. Um, and it also takes the pressure off because you can if you try a lot of different things, you can realize that you might be naturally talented and amazing at something and you might love something way more than you thought you would. And maybe that will change your life. So just like, yeah, yeah I think that was a really valuable final push, man. Thanks. Thanks. Um, that list you mentioned, right. You know, like get that off your checklist or whatever, you know, it's important too, to realize that that list should be internal goals, right? You, your list should not be win a Nobel prize or <laughs> get it, win a Grammy or sell a thousand, you know, or a hundred thousand copies of your book, your, your, your goal should be write a book, you know, make a record, mm. you know, those are, those are exciting things that are, that you can accomplish. You know, you can't guarantee, you can't, you, you can't know how things are going to be received in the world. You can't like, there's no way to guarantee you're going to sell a hundred thousand copies or win a Nobel prize or anything, but you can write a book 
And if you have the wherewithal to realize that that book wasn't quite what it could have been, then you could write another one that's better. Well, and also the fact that you want to start doing something like write a book, you might take a course on how to do it or start following people on Twitter or following prominent figures in the field. And once you start doing that, you've surrounded yourself with, like we were talking about before, that that gap where you're surrounding yourself with the best of the best. And now like you're comparing yourself to, to all of those people. But you also have to realize that like, look around you, like how many people do you know that have written a book? Or how many people do you know have you know, actually taking up that hobby that they said they were all always going to do, like compare yourself to that mm-hmm. or, or compare yourself to the other, you know, infinite versions of yourself that there could be right. <laughs> that did not do that thing that did not start checking things off of their list. Right. Compare yourself to that rather than to the top. You know what I mean? I think that's a much more healthier way to kind of approach it. Oh, that's, that's so hard and so important. And, so tough. Yeah. And then, you know, with social media and everything, it's just so hard to do, but yeah. Yeah. My friend Keith says, don't look in the just keep swimming ahead and don't look at that in that next lane, you know? Right. Can I mention my online courses? Oh, please do. Because they're, they're a big part of what I'm doing at saw. So there's an online link to the, the courses, but, um, but in, important because we, we mentioned how to say everything and that's actually a free download at my online site. So oh, nice. Yeah, all 192 pages, if you can make it through it, it's a free download. Um, but I, I do lots of online courses. And the, the one probably most related to what we're talking about is called Storytelling Flow. And it's really just, it's just designed to get you, um, it's designed to get you throwing ideas at yourself kind of so fast that you don't even realize what you've done until you've done it. And it's a surprising story. And that's what we try and, that's what I try and get out of people. It's a, it's, it's a really fun course. Nice. Can we link that specifically in the show notes page? Sure. I'll send you a link to that if you like. Cool. We will link that up then uh, at the show notes page. Again, yourcreativepush.com slash Tom Hart, T-O-M-H-A-R-T. Tom, thank you so much, man. You, I know that your school and your books, um, but your school specifically, um, because that's what I have <laughs> experience with, with my listeners uh-huh. that love it and did say that it changed their life. So uh, bravo to you for that. And uh, I can't wait to see who else comes out of your program. Cool. Well, thank you very, very, very much. Thanks. And thanks for your great podcast. Thanks for just keeping people inspired. It's really important. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> cool. uh, very cool. All right. And again, uh, the link is sawcomics.org. Uh, and again, at today's show notes page, you can find all of those links. Tom, thanks again, man. All right. Thanks. Uh, my thanks once again to Tom for coming on the show. Two really big points from this episode. Number one, uh, the title of this episode, Just Say Something. That is a major lesson for me, as we'll be talking about either next week or the week after. I'll be doing a solo episode talking about my Cramuary Challenge, if you remember that, and how I was going to attempt to write the Your Creative Push book in one month. There were many different reasons why I decided to postpone that, but one of the main reasons is why so many people are held back from writing a book or starting a major uh, giant project is the fact that you want to say everything. How am I supposed to capture three, almost 300 episodes worth of content, of lessons, of things that we've talked about, of stories we've heard? of ways to get past our resistances and reminders that we need to do this on a daily basis to get to our creative passions. How am I supposed to compile that into one book? I want to say everything. And it's so hard to start and just say something when you have everything on your mind. But it's so important and such an important reminder from Tom in this episode that you just need to say something. You need to start somewhere. You need to find that first step, that first talking point, that first utterance of your voice. Just get it out there and start saying that one thing. And and the funny thing is, is that sometimes you can say everything you need in just that something, or you can realize that one something captures so much more than you thought it would, or it takes you in a direction that you never thought you would have gone. Ask yourself, how often have you stopped and just waited and waited and waited to say something because of the fact that what you wanted to say you thought was too big of a thing, it was too big of a project, or it was maybe beyond you. Maybe you felt that you didn't have the authority to speak on such a topic. But let me just tell you that if, as long as you're a human being living in this world, you do have the authority to talk on any subject, to give your own unique perspective on it, and to say your piece. 
just say something. And my other point that I wanted to bring up from the episode was that trick that he had to trick your inner critic to keep telling yourself that what you're doing really isn't that big of a deal. And like I said in the episode, I really do believe that it is a huge deal, but just in the fact that you are expressing yourself, that you are actually taking the time and saying something. You are putting yourself out there. But the actual content, the actual thing that you're creating isn't that big of a deal. It doesn't matter if you want to take piano lessons and you actually you know, end up sucking at the piano. Nobody's going to care. <laughs> if you want to write a poem and you never wrote a poem before and you suck at it, nobody's going to care. If you want to knit a scarf <laughs> and it comes out to just be a bunch of threads that are <laughs> that you just kind of throw over yourself, you know, nobody's going to care. It's okay. The important thing is that you just do it and it's okay to just do art to just have it be something that you do like playing video games or like watching tv it's okay for it to just be something that you do take some of that pressure off and convince your inner critic that it is not a big deal because guess what it actually is not a big deal if you screw up it's not going to change your place in the world except for the fact that you're actually doing something that you enjoy like Tom said, you know, God's thumb isn't going to come down and press you and smush you into the ground because you happen to suck at this thing. But in fact, the opposite is actually going to be true. And you're going to actually kind of be raised up a little bit. You're going to feel a lot lighter, especially when you realize that it is not a big deal and that uh, you can just have this be something that you do. And when you do that, and you can also experiment with many different things, like Tom and I said in the episode, you'll also be able to find things that you actually truly love that you never thought you would actually have a talent for, a knack for, or a love for. Take some of that pressure off. Tell your inner critic that, you know, what I'm about to do isn't a huge deal. Let's have some fun with it. And uh, I think that you will be a much happier and a much better creative person for it. So again, big thank you to Tom for those two very important lessons among many other lessons from this episode. Again, you can head to his website, tomhart.net, or on today's show notes page, we'll have it linked up where you can get um, how to say everything for free at today's show notes page, yourcreativepush.com slash 286. But that is all I've got for you today. So hopefully you were inspired to go and get your work done. So go and get it done. Remember that it is okay for your art to be just something that you do and go and say something. I love you all so much. Go get some amazing work done, and we will see you next time. Bye. Never miss a push. Head to yourcreativepush.com slash subscribe to find the easiest way for you to subscribe to the podcast.